for everyone's time. Uh, I know we're going to get people uh, that are continuing to trickle in, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I'm Fred Blackwell. Uh, I'm the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation and one of the three co-chairs uh, for this process. And uh, I think I can speak for the other two co-chairs as well when I say I'm looking forward to getting back to my day job. Um, I want to first um, thank everybody, all of you all who are around this table, um, for your uh, willingness to be um, a part of this. There have been uh, countless hours and numerous meetings uh, that have gone into kind of generating what uh, we think is some of our uh, best thinking about how to uh, tackle some of the housing issues that we are all uh, faced with at a regional level um, of scale. And I can say that, you know, when I took this on, I knew uh, that it was going to be time consuming and I knew the job was going to be dangerous. And I think it's been both more time consuming and more dangerous than I anticipated. Um, I want to send a special uh, shout out and thanks to uh, the working group moderators. Uh, these are folks who were a part of the technical committee, uh, agreed to um, basically chair uh, subcommittees to work on very uh, specific uh, bodies of work. Uh, as many of you all know, we started with uh, 50 plus uh, ideas and strategies that got uh, whittled down to 17 and is now down uh, to the 10 that are uh, in front of you today. Uh, and the ability to get from 50 uh, to 10 uh, was really based on uh, the really hard work and dedication of Denise, Linda, Jennifer uh, and Derricka, who really, I think, uh, did exemplary work. Uh, and so just a round of applause for them uh, would really, really be wonderful. Um, where we are, as you all know, has been the product of actually two bodies of work. There's been a technical committee broken down into subgroups that has been meeting uh, quite frequently. Uh, and you all have been meeting on a quarterly basis. And kind of all of this is culminating uh, in us hopefully uh, making a decision today. Uh, it will then uh, go to the governing bodies of uh, ABAG and MTC, uh, and then after that uh, to the legislature where we are sure there's uh, work that will continue uh, to have to be done uh, at that level. Um, the thing that I wanted to um, uh, emphasize today is kind of the agenda. What we're gonna do is, uh, after a comment from uh, my other co-chair, um, we're going to go to public comment, uh, and we, uh, after public comment, uh, are going to do two things. One is um, go over uh, racial equity uh, analysis that's been done uh, by MTC. This has been months in the making, and folks have wanted to make sure that if we move forward, we have uh, something substantive that kind of looks at what we're doing in relationship to some of the equity issues in the region. And so that will be uh, presented, and you'll get a little bit of an overview of that. Uh, and then um, there will be a 30,000 foot level um, presentation that Steve will do uh, on the compact. Uh, you all have been in the deep dives on different el uh, elements of the compact, so we're going to give you an overview there. Uh, after that, we will, um, there'll be an opportunity for you to both ask questions if there are things that need to be clarified and make comments, uh, and we will ask you to uh, cast a vote uh, in terms of your position relative to where we are with the compact. Um, and then we will close out with a discussion of next steps. So that's the um, agenda. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Leslie, and then we will move into public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. I, I too want to thank you all for your commitment uh, to this really important issue. Uh, some of us had the opportunity to visit New York uh, last week. Was it last week? It's all blending together and to see the good work that they're doing there. And, and also, it put in perspective to me uh, the challenge that, that we have jumped into with CASA, uh, because New York, for all its size, is one city, and it's a city-county government. It has 56 elected officials. Uh, we are a region with nine counties, 101 cities, and I believe about 10 times as many elected officials, so about uh, 560 plus elected officials. So this is a, a big uh, undertaking. Uh, we also um, 
you know, I'm, I also don't know that this has been done before. So I think this is, this is pretty groundbreaking uh, to, to have an agreement like this. So just, uh, Fred mentioned briefly that, uh, that we're going forward to the MTC Commission and ABAG Executive Committee. Uh, December 19th is the MTC meeting, and then I believe it is the 17th of January, we're uh, going to the ABAG Executive Committee. Um, and then we hope to have a celebration party. So I don't believe we have a date set for that right now, but it will be with both the steering committee and the technical committee. Um, and we'll formally thank folks and, and make sure that, that we're keeping you in the loop of, of what's ahead and what's happening and we're gonna do a ceremonial signing. Um, and then, um, you know, we are, as of Thursday, assuming that, that we, uh, we all agree today that the, the compact is something that we support, uh, we'll jump into implementation and we will be providing you with more information uh, about how implementation will move forward. But the important thing for us is making sure the compact stays together. Uh, we recognize that this is, uh, that we have 10 different proposals, but they all are uh, connected and we want the, the package to go forward in Sacramento uh, as one. Um, but we also know that some of it's gonna change in Sacramento. So uh, our job uh, when we implement is trying to keep the intent of the, of the compact and all of these pieces together as they move forward. Um, so I think uh, that is it, and I know that we're uh, gonna, going to move to public comment. Did we have, uh, did we have like a last call for public comment, or are we? Um, I sent out a last call about five minutes ago. Um, if you can go right now, if you don't, haven't put one in, that's great, but we're about to close it off. Okay. Uh, we are ready to start public comment. I have quite a few cards. Uh, speakers are limited to two minutes per person. We have a lot to get through, so it is two minutes is two minutes. Uh, the first speaker is Tim Frank, followed by Tess Wellborn. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tim Frank. I'm the executive director of the Center for Sustainable Neighborhoods. So we support policies and projects that help build sustainable neighborhoods and regions. And we think that this body has an opportunity here to comment on, the, on or to help develop a, uh, a whole policy package that could help achieve this end. I don't actually think that the package as presented to you is yet quite complete. Um, and I don't think this is a matter of perfect being the enemy of the good. Um, it, there was throughout the process this interesting pattern where one particular constituency, which was uh, labor actually, had their issues uh, identified on an element by element by element basis as to be deferred, to be determined. Um, and so we find ourselves at the end of the process and there's actually still a lot of missing um, uh, work to be done on that specific issue. Now, we're actually quite heartened by the uh, evolving consensus now on the tenant rights stuff. We think that's, that's great. We're really excited about that. Uh, we think that from an environmental perspective, the focus on getting the right product in the right area the, in terms of the design uh, features, we think that that's actually headed in the right direction. But we think that those, that both the, the, uh, the, the zoning changes and the streamlining and what's categorized as good government and the funding all need to be tied to important workforce development standards that, that help us to actually build the construction workforce that will be essential if we actually want to dramatically expand the production of housing in the Bay Area. So with that uh, uh, said, I, you know, it's, it's hard to comment on the very specific things that actually need to be uh, addressed here, but I think that the important thing to recognize is that there's work yet to be done, and it perhaps will be uh, left to the legislature to accomplish that, and I think it is important if, if folks want to uh, vote on this uh, compact to. Uh, recognize that there needs to be an asterisk that is explicitly recognized here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tess Wolburn is the next speaker followed by Adam Nugent. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to recognize that there have been a lot of good work, many good ideas, but please do remember you are an unelected body and you're not representative of the 100 cities and the nine Bay Area counties. This has got to be one of the flaws that undermines all of your work. 
I'd like to see uh, your work expanded. I'd like to see representatives of our citizens of the Bay Area in this. Some of the many flaws, and I've pro provided a letter to the secretary for, with copies for all of you that I see in this process, is that uh, you are blaming cities for failing to build housing when in most cases cities do not build housing. And in many cases, there are cities that have approved housing. In San Francisco, more than 40,000 units have been approved, but not built. It's not the city that has been holding that up. Another flaw, ignoring the role of the federal government's housing policies and practices, which have resulted in the kinds of zoning that we have now. Ignoring the impact of Prop 13 and the, the consequences for cities that are starved of money. Ignoring the fact that local impact fees for office and housing development are vastly undercharged. Failing to take into account the role of international finance and housing production. Overestimating the value of transit-oriented development while underestimating it's the impact on existing affordable housing in communities of color. You're also disregarding the cycles of boom and bust, climate change and disaster, and how currently affordable housing is being eroded. In San Francisco, we lose one unit of affordable housing each time we build two new ones. Something's wrong with that process. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Adam Nugent, followed by Shajuti Hussain. Hi, I am Adam Nugent. I'm a landscape architect uh, for the state of California. Uh, I live in San Mateo. I'm a former captain and OEF vet. I'm an elder millennial. <laughs> and I am privileged enough to be able to be here today. I'm able to play hooky from work. I'm hoping to become a father. Uh, and I'm a third generation Californian, but I also consider myself a migrant. I actually grew up in Minnesota, uh, and I'm very proud of Minnesota, I'm proud of Minneapolis. If you don't know what Minneapolis just did, you probably shouldn't be here. I also had the opportunity in graduate school to study in Germany. Germany shows us why we have double the carbon emissions of Europe. And it's because they know how to do transit, they know how to do housing, and they know how to live much more sustainably. If we don't take a regional approach to solving the problems of our crushing housing so shortage, our wealth and racial segregation, displacement, and our auto-dependent ecological disaster that is the 20th century style sprawl of the Bay Area, these problems will remain as intractable as Jim Crow laws were in the South without federal interven intervention. I appreciate all the work that you have done, and I know that when this goes to the state legislature of elected officials, that you will have my su support and the support of many people who know that they need housing and they need to live sustainably in California. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shijuti Hussain, followed by Eileen Boken. Hi, I'm Shijuti Hussain, an attorney at Public Advocates, which is one of the co-chairs of the Six Wins for Social Equity Network. Um, Six Wins sent you a letter this morning. It's also either in front of you or at the front table. Um, to summarize that, we are excited that CASA is creating a new story for the Bay Area, but we're also aware that some of the core principles of CASA have been ignored in the current draft. To turn those core principles into action, we have four key asks. We ask that you amend the CASA Compact to one, document the lack of consensus on elements five, six, and seven, especially seven. Two, to guarantee that protections and revenues for affordable housing come before or simultaneously with elements five, six, and seven. Three, to use the sensitive community maps developed by the Geography Work Group. And four, to even the funding across the three Ps. I also want to point out that on page three of your ag agenda packet, a paragraph about the last technical committee meeting is slightly misleading. It says 28 members voted in favor of the compact and one against, but the technical committee had a gradient vote on a scale of one to five, and five members had voted a three or four, which to me is not the same as favorable to the compact. Each of those members and a member who voted five gave critical feedback most of which coincide with these four asks from Six Winds, but they were not reflected in the memo you received. 
So unlike with that meeting, I ask that the discussion from today is accurately reflected and fully reflected in the next draft of the compact and in any other updates. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen Boken, followed by Lynette Lee Eng. Eileen Boken, Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods, here on my own behalf. The proposed CASA compact has sufficient, uh, significant deficiencies. Therefore, I would urge the steering committee not to approve it today. The financial component contains a sales tax. On the November 2016 ballot in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco's rejected a sales tax increase for homelessness and transportation. Even though it was spearheaded by Scott Weiner, Prop K was defeated by a two to one margin. The financing component also contains a parcel tax. This year, a ballot initiative in San Francisco uh, for a parcel tax for housing failed to qualify for the ballot. San Francisco already has four parcel taxes. The comp, uh, CASA compact cons, uh, draft term sheets have the following elements. Emergency rent cap. San Francisco already has rent control. Right to legal counsel for eviction proceedings. San Francisco already has its own implemented a guaranteed right to counsel to suit its needs. Barriers to ADUs. San Francisco already has addressed this issue on its own to suit its own needs. Density bonus and inclusionary laws. San Francisco has already addressed these issues over the past five years on its own to suit its needs. Minimum zoning on transit for housing. San Francisco is already a transit rich city. The city's planning department has estimated that 90% of the city's landmass is within one quarter, uh, one quarter mile of transit. This element, if Im implemented, would cause 90% of San Francisco to have virtually no zoning. This is completely unacceptable. On the housing side, the Costa Compact fails to include emerging trends such as conversions uh, to short-term rentals and absentee owners who occupy their units only several months a year. In San Francisco alone, it is estimated that these fa uh, factors affect 20 to 30,000 units. Uh, the, thank you. Thank you. Lynette Lee Eng, followed by Pat Eklund. Good afternoon. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm here to appeal to you to listen to local elected officials and other concerned speakers that are here today. This compact as written is not feasible or respectful to local excuse me, jurisdictions. It does nothing to help solve our traffic and transportation issues. It will seriously interfere with our ability to fund infrastructure and services. It will have the opposite effect of its desired, opposite of its desired effect. It will make housing more expensive by effectively upzoning significant areas. Last night, the Los Altos City Council voted unanimously and will be sending a letter to MTC, ABAG, and other elected officials and cities association opposing this compact as written. Elected officials have asked, do not approve this compact in this form. Go back, engage with us, create something that is truly feasible without massive adverse effects on our ability to govern and provide services to our constituents. We oppose top-down, behind closed doors planning. By moving forward, you are asking everyday citizens to take the brunt of this plan through increased housing costs, harming infrastructure, and decimating city services like schools, water, and public safety. We are concerned that this money will be managed and dispersed by an independent body that is not subject to citizen oversight. Please be aware, the increase in taxes will hit cities purse contributions cities as purse contributions go up and this will significantly impact the services we provide our residents this compact will make it difficult for local officials to do our job and serve our residents thank you thank you pat eklund followed by jennifer hernandez Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pat Eklund, and I am on the Novato City Council, and I've been former mayor uh, six times in our community. And I also serve on the ABAG Executive Board. I represent the 11 cities from Marin County. 
I'm also a past president of the League of California Cities. I first want to acknowledge all of the tremendous work that the co-chairs and the steering committee and also the technical committees have been embarking on over this past 18 months, and especially the staff that's been staffing all of these committees, all the way from the clerks all the way up to the planners. So great, great job. Um, unfortunately, um, I believe that this process is fundamentally flawed. The reason it is fundamentally flawed is because you do not have local governments, the cities, adequately represented on the technical committee and on the steering committee. Most of the cities that have been participating have been the larger cities. They don't have the same kind of problems that we do for the small and the middle-sized cities. So it's fundamentally flawed, and I would urge this committee not to vote until after we have had a general assembly of all 101 cities and nine counties. Let's make sure that every city in this region is involved in this process, or I can guarantee you, you will have opposition in Sacramento, and this is not what we should be doing in the Bay Area. We should not be pitting all different interests against each other. We should be working collaboratively forward. And uh, as you know, I've attended almost every technical and steering committee meeting. Not once were my comments addressed. Not once did any of the technical or steering committee meeting members came up to me and say, hey, can we have a conversation about some of those issues? I've been elected official for over 23 years. I worked for the US Environmental Protection Agency for over 35 years. I'm not a dummy. And I have raised some very important issues about local control that most of you have just totally bypassed. And we don't need another regional agency. There's a host of problems with this. And I urge you not to vote until after the 101 cities and nine counties all get together and have a vote on this compact. Thank you. Jennifer Hernandez, followed by Michelle Majud. Jennifer Hernandez from Holland and Knight, a privileged member, uh, honored to have been part of the technical committee. But I want to actually speak on behalf of the 200, which is a civil rights group uh, that is very focused on middle income housing for working Californians and most importantly for home ownership which is a huge, huge, huge level of economic security, again, available only to very, very hardworking families and now not available even to them. It was really satisfying for CASA to recognize this constituency. The missing middle is so often ignored, and this time it was not. So like all compacts, like all compromises, there are pluses and minuses for everyone, but this was a very informed process that will now go through the full democratic process, but we'd very much support the compact as it is, as a way to move the dialogue forward with a very representative group of non-elected stakeholders so the electeds can now do their job. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle Majid, followed by Anita, I'm sorry if I mispronounce this, Enander, I believe. Uh, hi, my name is Michelle Majid. I work at Urban Habitat and am part of the Six Wins for Social Equity Network. As Shajuthi mentioned, we, um, we submitted a letter to you all earlier today. I just want to read portions of that letter, um, standing together as a coalition. So on behalf of Six Wins, equity advocates representing the affordable housing, environmental justice, faith, labor, legal service providers, and tenant rights communities, we write to you with urgency and collaboration. As you are well aware, the lives of working families in the Bay Area are disrupted every day as they are forced to leave behind their social, spiritual, professional, and cultural networks due to arbitrary evictions, rent increases, and displacement pressures. CASA presents a unique opportunity to create a new story for the Bay Area, a future where our region is characterized by equity, diversity, self-determination, and opportunity, and where stable and affordable housing is a fundamental right. This is why many of us, alongside you, have been involved and engaged in the process for almost two years and have formed non-traditional partnerships amongst ourselves and pushed for robust regional policies that center the needs of low-income communities and communities of color. Yet the details matter. Um, why, where and how we develop matters. Creating the right 
map that uh, overlays where the sensitive communities are against these policies matter. CASA can be truly game changing and serve as a national model, but only if it is explicitly structured to stabilize communities with universal tenant protections so that current residents can prosper in place, break up historic and existing patterns of segregation by allowing new development at low income levels in opportunity rich and exclusive neighborhoods, and funding solutions for tenant protections, affordable housing preservation, and new affordable housing production. We hope you'll take seriously what we put forward um, and use that as part of how you vote today. Thank you. Thank you. Anita Anander followed by Aaron Eckhouse. You get an A for pronouncing my name right. Thank you. I'm here as a newly elected city council member from Los Altos where I defeated an incumbent in November, our mayor, on a platform of greater resident influence on what happens in our city. There's obviously been enormous work that's gone into this and I applaud everyone's energy that has contributed to it. But for many reasons which have already been cited, this would be an inefficient, massive band-aid that doesn't address root causes, some of which I just heard addressed by Tess Wellborn's letter. It also completely ignores MTC's primary mission of solving transportation and traffic issues, which is a major contributor to our housing problem. Further, if you move forward without modifications that address local feasibility, you guarantee a massive reaction, a negative reaction, and resistance by local government. Members of the ABAG Executive Committee have articulated some of the problems of this being a tops-down, one-size-fits-all pseudo-solution that will cause problems with the ability of local governments to fund our infrastructures and critical ser services. Please listen to us. An additional problem is that the compact tries to shift funding of below market rate housing as well as the infrastructure that greater housing requires schools and transportation to residents instead of those who cause the problem. If you think local governments will welcome being relieved of needing to deal with housing proposals, if you think that we want a mandated ministerial approval process with setbacks and height limits and incentives mandated by long, you are wrong. The people elected us to make that decision. It is our job. I fully expect you will support this compact today, but I ask that if you do so, it goes forward with a recommendation for local government input before the executive committees of ABAG and MTC act on this matter and improperly represent that it somehow represents a consensus of local government, which it does not. Thank you. Aaron Eckhouse, followed by Rick Hall. Hello, my name is Aaron Eckhouse. I live in North Oakland. Uh, before that, I lived in South Berkeley. Been living in sort of the border between those two cities for the last three years, and I'm still not entirely sure where one starts and the other ends. So it makes a lot of sense to me that we would try to address this problem at a regional level. I think we've gotten well beyond uh, the size of solution that one city can implement on its own. And I applaud you for taking this broad look. When I think about the issues that I have seen in my neighborhood, uh, I see a lot of places where this compact would help. I remember there being a huge fight over a proposal to, to build a new apartment building in my neighborhood where one of the things that people really wanted was for money to contribute to protecting tenants from eviction. And I think how much easier that all could have been if we had just decided to make this a broader social priority and guarantee the right to civil counsel for everyone in the Bay Area, like this compact proposes to do. Uh, I think about all of the renovation work that I see happening in my neighborhood and wondering why those construction resources are not being used to create new homes for people that we so desperately need. And so I really uh, am excited about the framework in this compact to allow the production of more homes in more parts of our region and more parts of our city so we can have more neighbors. Um, so thank you all for the work that you put into this and I hope you'll move this compact forward today uh, so that we can have a more affordable Bay Area going forward into the future. Thank you. Rick Hall followed by Victoria Fierce. I urge you to vote no on this compact. It's flawed and anti-democratic. It's deeply flawed. It's it's deeply flawed in that supply side solutions. Now I've got this screwed up. Thank you. Supply side solutions will not so, uh, <coughs> solve the affordability crisis 
and you, you ignore the demand side of the equation. Unpaced growth is unsustainable. The compact should fund the cities to assess and build infrastructure to accommodate growth, not steal money from them and overburden tax tired citizens by imposing growth that they then have to deal with infrastructure. The concept of creating an unelected uh, body to manage land use and dollar distribution is anti-democratic and abhorrent. Pace and timing of development is ignored. Our transit systems are full and it takes decades to expand them. That's what you should be working on. The compact has been violated already. All elements were supposed to advance forward together, but Scott Weiner has advanced SB 50, which is tied in right in with, he's tied right in with this thing, and he's jumping ahead and leaving behind the protections and other pieces. You cannot continue to take away land use powers from our duly elected officials and hand them over to unelected bodies. Please vote no. Thank you, Victoria Fierce, followed by Susan Kirsch. Hello, my name is Victoria Fierce. Uh, I live in downtown Oakland, uh, but I'm not actually from here. Um, first question I have is, am I a growth that is a burden to be dealt with, or am I a human being with hopes, dreams, desires, loves, tragedies, all the things that most people experience? Um, pay attention to not just the content of the comments of the people that you're hearing up here today, but also who is in favor and who is against. And for reference, I'm in favor of this. Uh, I'm queer, I'm trans, I'm under 30, and I pay $2,100 a month out of my $4,000 paycheck a month. That's about half, and like, that's still 90,000 a year. That's middle class, but I still can't live here in downtown. It sucks. And even this morning, I had to buy a $500 phone because for whatever reason, it fell off the ferry. That sucks. Uh, <laughs> I will never own a home out here. I can't afford a car, even if I have to move out further to the suburbs. Uh, I'm an Ohioan who moved out here on July 5th, 2014. My hometown of Akron was dying. We're in the Rust Belt. We, San Francisco has problems that Akron would just kill for, in that we've got a problem of not enough jobs and a whole bunch of empty housing. Out here is completely different, which is to say that also, back in Akron, I lost my job in 2014, and there was nothing for me left, absolutely nothing. My support network had dis disintegrated. They'd all moved out to the West Coast. So I was privileged to know a friend who lived out here and let me live on their couch for three months. The first three months I lived out here, I was homeless because I lived on my friend's couch. Uh, that's when I found my first apartment building. And even then, uh, I got halfway across the Bay Area from San Bruno to uh, Oakland. And the landlord called me up and said, oh, I'm sorry, it's already been rented out. That's ridiculous. I'd only been on the BART for an hour at that. We need more housing. This compact is not perfect, but holy crap, will it make solving a lot of these other problems a lot easier? We absolutely need these things. Please do this and think about me, my generation, who needs housing. Thank you. Susan Kirsch followed by Peter Papadopoulos. Hi, Susan Kirsch. I'm the founder of Livable California. And I want to acknowledge, too, all of the effort that's gone into this compact. A part of what concerns me about the compact is how much it feels like this is sort of the insider baseball trading going on, that what we have for many of the committees are big businesses, big cities, and what's been excluded are the small cities and the everyday citizens, as other speakers have pointed to. You know, I, I'm looking at the cover page of your CASA compact, and it's called a 15-year emergency policy package to confront the housing crisis in the San Francisco Bay Area. So for one thing, it seems to me a 15-year crisis is something more like a 15-year crisis in planning or analyzing what it, what's at the heart of a problem that a crisis, unless it's famine because there's been no rain or something beyond control, but this is a 15-year crisis, is mislabeling what the real crisis is which is the undermining of local control as a basic building block of democracy. And as other speakers have said, local cities, the 101 cities, are many of them not happy with, with what's being proposed by this insider group. 
And you have evidence of that in the November elections, where, where in many of the cities, those incumbents who have been going along with, it's a housing crisis, instead of understanding how this is businesses continuing to find ways that cities can fund their own profits, what we have is that kind of crisis that voters are recognizing that they like having access to the people who are representing them. The idea of a regional agency as represented by, as represented by CASA is not something that the public is in favor of. I expect you will vote in favor of this, of CASA and the compact, but I hope there will be openings for additional inclusion of cities and the point of view of the 101 cities and the citizens who live there. Thank you. Peter Papadopoulos, followed by Ken Bukowski. Good morning, committee members. Peter Papadopoulos with the Mission Economic Development Agency here in San Francisco Mission District. Uh, we sent you a letter this morning from our executive director, and I wanted to follow up and highlight a few of those points. I feel that there are still um, some concerns that, that we want to pinpoint. There are some significant gaps here, especially when it comes to issues such as sensitive communities. Uh, we're happy to see uh, this um, work group new sensitive communities map floated today, and we strongly urge you to support such a map, something that expands the guidelines. We don't think it really makes sense that a community that has gone the gamut from uh, redlining and disinvestment through hyperinvestment and mass gentrification and displacement that's made it a national story wouldn't even appear on the map of what is a sensitive community. So we ask you to hone in on those, and not only, of course, in our neighborhood, in similar, very vulnerable and very duress to neighborhoods around the Bay Area. We think these neighborhoods should be exempt, and they should be exempt, not deferred, because this compact, while it's well-meaning in this way, does not get into its local issues. It does not. We've been working for years, for example, in the Mission District with the planning department towards equity outcomes and have significantly redone the entire uh, functionality of much of the way the neighborhood planning works. And that kind of community involvement, thousands and thousands of hours, needs to be respected and it needs to create a safeguard for those communities. Preservation needs to be brought forward. In communities like the Mission, buying small apartment units and preserving those threatened families and small businesses has been critical to stabilizing the neighborhood and that needs to be fully funded and recognized uh, in concourse with the other of the three Ps. There needs to be net new inclusionary. For neighborhoods like the Mission District, it wouldn't make sense to offer billions of dollars in incentives to developers and not offer a net new affordable value recapture. And finally, we do need to incentivize affordable housing and find a way to identify those revenues and make sure it's funded before this compact goes forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Bukowski, followed by Carlos Boca Regra. Hi, uh, I have a few comments. Uh, I, the cities have been left out of this process. Uh, have we ever thought about organizing a committee of elected officials to solve the problem? Have we ever asked elected officials to solve the problem? I don't think so. Well, I understand that, but you, you So I, I think I've advocated for the elected officials to create an alternative to CASA. I think this is great work. I think it's recognized, but we need an alternative. We also need more focus on displacement. That's the major problem that's happening in the cities because people living in the cities a long time, they're being forced out. And I don't think that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos Bocaregra, followed by the last speaker, Milo Trous. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Bocanegra, and I'm a housing and immigration attorney that works for a nonprofit in the Mission District in San Francisco. I was reading through the materials, and I read something interesting about a uh, uh, a documentary that's being done on the housing crisis and a statement saying that they are having a hard time finding people, especially people of color, willing to talk and speak on camera about their experience. And I think we have to ask ourselves why. And I think at this time that they're probably not willing to be tokenized at the same time that we're going to pass a compact that's going to lead to a devastation of a lot of these core communities that are feeling rising housing prices and leading them straight to my doorstep and oftentimes not having rep representation and being left out the door and out of the Bay Area. 
So to that extent, I believe it's incredibly important that we ensure that our most vulnerable residents in overheated neighborhoods are not the targets of additional displacement pressure, as sensitive communities provision is required that should exempt these most vulnerable communities unless they choose to opt in through a thoughtful community-based process, particularly as agreement and if you look at them they they uh, uh, they cover I think fairly clearly what you would be saying if you vote a one I'm very pleased and fully support this decision two I'm mostly satisfied and I can support the decision three I'll go along with the will of the group sort of a okay but not jumping up and down Fourth, and, and even the number four says, I have reservations, serious reservations, but I respect that we are focused on the regional needs and compromising where needed for the greater good. That's a really important concept. This whole thing is built around a regional solution in the form of a, a crisis that we're trying to deal with for a limited amount of time, we said 15 years, um, for the greater good, and we'll talk about what the greater good means when we get to some other comments later. But And then five is finally, I don't like this deal at all. So that's going to be the voting method you have today. It's in front of you. Um, we'll end up, I think, at some point asking you if you have any comments, feel free. And then Steve is going to walk us through um, 
some of the technical and or generic issues that are in each of the 10 compact items. Steve? Thank you, uh, Mike. And before I proceed, I, I just wanted to publicly thank all three of our co-chairs uh, who have forsaken their day jobs, uh, and we have benefited greatly from that. And they'll never do it again. Um, I swear. I, my job is to walk you through uh, the compact before you, and I think you've seen parts and pieces of a lot of it, but I don't think you've seen it quite together. Um, and in fact, today you're seeing it not quite together still. We're down to two parts or two pieces. Uh, what you have in your packet is a memorandum uh, which covers uh, some changes that the co-chairs have made since your technical committee acted on the draft compact you have, which starts uh, on the page with the pretty picture of Caltrain on the cover. Um, so essentially, the amendments that you see in the memo uh, amend uh, the, ca the CASA compact that the technical committee uh, recommended to you by an overwhelming margin. Uh, so that's your guide to uh, what is before you. And if you could turn to uh, the, the cover of the document, um, I, I think the, the subtitle really contains three very important pieces of context for what the compact is. The first, as is mentioned, that this is an emergency. This is a crisis. And I believe it was Supervisor Cortesi who said, be bold in light of that crisis and that emergency. Um, secondly, as I think one of the public speakers mentioned, it's intended to be a 15-year concentrated effort. Uh, in Sacramento, that could mean sunsetting some of the bills after that period of time, after we're sort of over the hump. That, at least, is the intention. And third, this is about the Bay Area. Um, there will probably be bills and initiatives that CASA may want to support that are statewide in nature, but generally speaking, this package of policy proposals, which will turn into legislation, is intended to be Bay Area specific. Uh, so that we can innovate, so that we can respond to our specific set of problems, which I think most would agree are probably the most severe in the state of California. Um, turning into the document, you'll see there is a preamble at the outset, uh, two pages, uh, which is sort of our version of the problem statement, and obviously our housing uh, issues are a doozy of a problem. Um, so uh, you may have your own way of looking at it. That's CASA's way of looking at it. Next after that is an introduction which lays out the process that we have followed over these 18 months. Um, and then you get to the elements themselves, and there are 10 of them. Uh, and I think there are some fairly straightforward ways of grouping them uh, together. The first three uh, are the protection package. Um, and I think you're well aware that we've been using this architecture of the three Ps, protection, preservation, and production, as a way of outlining and organizing our thinking. This is the protection piece. Uh, it includes three elements. The first element, which is the just cause eviction policy. Uh, the second element, which is an emergency rent cap and the third element, which is emergency rent assistance and access to legal counsel. Uh, I am not going to go into detail on really any of the compact elements, uh, but I will mention here a couple of overarching themes. One of them is these three uh, elements are intended to set a floor in the region uh, for protecting tenants. There are cities in the region that have already enacted some of these measures, and CASA's intention is to leave those measures alone. Um, and where they are more restrictive, perhaps, than the CASA approach uh, to allow them uh, to prevail uh, in the event of, of any conflict. Um, you see uh, next to each of these items, and you see it throughout the document, a map, which sort of tells you what the problem is we're trying to solve in many cases or helps explain part of the solution. So those are the first three items. Uh, the fourth item in the compact I think I, I can describe even more briefly, and that is we need to build more accessory dwelling units and tiny homes. Enough said. 
Um, and this document and this measure lays out a series of improvements. We've already seen changes in state law. We've seen changes in the ground, I think, that are very encouraging. Uh, but we need to do more, uh, is the conclusion of your technical committee on that subject. Turning to compact element number five, six, and seven, um, these are the three, I think, that, that hold together and deal with the production side of the question, uh, as well as, to a limited extent, I think, the uh, preservation side as well. And uh, I, I would sort of characterize these three as trying to tune up the housing project delivery machine, uh, which I think it's fair to say is leaking plenty of oil these days. Uh, and is not producing uh, with sufficient speed, with sufficient certainty, uh, the kind of new housing stock that we need. Uh, if you could look at compact element number five, and this is something that it has in common with compact element number seven, there is the notion uh, on this page of sensitive communities. Um, and uh, CASA throughout its process has been very focused on the needs of our low-income uh, residents and people of color, especially where they are concentrated in certain communities. Um, and we have been looking at lots of maps of ways to document uh, that phenomenon. Um, what you have at your table uh, in format, I hope, that's large enough you can read it, uh, is the latest version of this map, which is probably, uh, you know, map 57.0. Um, one thing I want to, uh, if I can, encourage you not to do is to focus too much on the map that's in front of you. Uh, because uh, I think it probably does represent a better approach to the subject than map 3.0, uh, but this is not the last map that will happen. Uh, in fact, uh, Senator Weiner's bill, uh, Senate Bill 50 that's been introduced, uh, talks about a process whereby the State Housing and Community Development Department would engage with local communities and regional uh, en entities and actually create the maps that would carry out state law. So what I would consider this to be is a bit of a prototype uh, of what uh, such a mapping uh, exercise might be. I think it's been very useful to go through the exercise we've gone through, and we've built, I think, a pretty good knowledge base with a lot of members of the advocacy community. And just to be clear about what you're seeing on this, uh, the, the blue dots are major rail and ferry stops in the Bay Area, and the red, uh, the red areas are the so-called sensitive uh, communities. What CASA proposes to do uh, with respect to those communities in element five and seven is sort of allow them a breather, uh, allow them some breathing room, uh, allow them a deferral period during which they can do planning, during which they can get ready uh, for growth, uh, readier for growth than they are today. Um, and that is the particular innovation uh, that's being suggested here in its focus on sensitive communities. Um, compact element number six, what you will see uh, are a series of proposals for standards. And the idea there is that what we have today in terms of the application process, impact fees, inclusionary zoning requirements, which are in, I think, something like 70 Bay Area communities, um, standards for downzoning and moratoria, we've, we've got a lot of different approaches that don't tend to agree with each other. And I, I suppose that's workable within each community, but it's not so workable at a regional scale because it tends to frustrate the ability to move more quickly and to move in a more standardized and predictable way. And so that's what element number six is looking for. Uh, number seven is a reaction, I think, to the bill that passed Senate, Senate Bill 35, which is in law, um, and the fact that it is probably enjoying, I think it's fair to say, uh, only modest success uh, because of the nature of uh, the bill and the law. And what compact element number seven tries to do is create a new path through that process uh, that enhances, actually, local discretionary review compared to the ministerial process in current law in exchange for scooting the projects through faster, including through a CEQA exemption for those kinds of projects that meet those requirements. So that's the production piece, the streamlining piece, the standardization piece. Um, 
Element number eight, I, I think, is sort of uh, an idea unto itself, and that is the fact that there is a lot of land in the Bay Area, uh, surplus or unused land, that is owned by government, uh, that is owned by the people, essentially. Um, and uh, it's a couple thousand acres in our region, and about 700 of those acres are very close to public transit. Um, and uh, that's probably one of the places that you want to try to develop new housing, uh, where we've made an investment in the transit infrastructure. And you can see on the chart uh, that's next to compact element number eight uh, that perhaps not surprisingly, two of the largest landowners of that public land near transit are transit agencies themselves, uh, BART and the Valley Transportation Authority in San Jose and Silicon Valley. So uh, we do believe that that holds great promise uh, to develop uh, new transit-oriented development, especially with local uh, government and special district partners. Uh, and this element includes several ideas about how to make those deals go faster uh, and to get that work underway. Finally, I would mention uh, element number nine and 10, which really do go together, and they're about the money. Um, and whenever you talk about money, and I've been talking about it for a long time in my career, you're going to run into trouble. Uh, people have lots of opinions about where to raise money. Usually it's from somebody besides them, uh, and how to spend it, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, and clearly, some part of this CASA agenda doesn't need money. It requires changes in law. But large elements of it do need money. Uh, if we're going to offer tenant protections, uh, that involve perhaps short-term rental assistance or access to legal counsel, that's going to cost money. If we are going to dramatically increase the construction of affordable housing, that's going to cost money. If we're going to preserve more of our existing affordable housing, that's going to cost money. Um, and so uh, to some extent, uh, the chart that you see on uh, this element is a bit of a pick-your-poison chart. Um, and I will say that during the process, we initially thought we would try to head toward a specific proposal. Uh, we backed off from that. And what you have before you, I want to emphasize the first word in the header of the chart, is a menu. Um, and uh, I don't think we're asking you to order off that menu today, but we probably will be asking the legislature uh, to order off that menu in terms of empowering the Bay Area to perhaps put one or more of these measures on the ballot uh, and see if the voters are willing to support them to fund the various activities that are recommended here in the compact. Um, so enough said about that. Um, you will see on page 38 quite a bit of detail about a proposed allocation formula, a proposed distribution formula that involves a fairly high return to source requirement. Obviously, all of that is negotiable. The last thing you'll see uh, on Compact Element 9 is administration. And what we point to in Element Number 10 is the creation of some kind of regional housing enterprise, essentially to become authorized to put these measures on the ballot and then administer the funding if they are successful. Um, I would look at this thing as primarily a financing vehicle as well as a data warehouse. Uh, one of the things that I certainly learned going through CASA is how poor the field of housing is in data. Um, transportation, we, we've got lots more, and I thought transportation uh, was sketchy. Um, so uh, one thing we do think some kind of regional enterprise needs to do is get all of us up to speed on what we're building, where we're building it, what's working, what's not working. Um, and so that is the basic idea. I will point to in here, uh, and we did it in every other place, we talk about models where we have models around the country. And one model uh, that I think many of us have been very impressed with is in New York uh, with this Housing Development Corporation. It's been around now since the early 70s. Uh, it generates about a billion dollars a year uh, for affordable housing. Uh, they spend 40 to 50 percent of it preserving existing affordable housing stock. So it's a fairly impressive example uh, and one that I think CASA believes we ought to consider uh, in terms of the Bay Area. 
Uh, I want to conclude uh, by talking about uh, the other item that Fred mentioned, which is the racial equity analysis that's on your agenda. And, and I'm not going to pour through the whole thing uh, to be mindful of your time, but I did want to show you just a couple of slides uh, to give you a sense of the work that has been done and the idea of continuing that work uh, over the course of implementing CASA. So again, this is not just something that we're going to do once and stop. Uh, this gives you a sense of how uh, the analysis was constructed in terms of these various lenses uh, in the five circles on the top. Moving to the next one, uh, this again is the map that I showed you earlier. Uh, and so clearly this is a geographical focus. Uh, of, of an exercise, and we use various overlays to try to test the various strategies in the compact in terms of how they play out in these communities. And finally, uh, some provisional findings, and let me emphasize the word provisional. Uh, th this is work that has to be ongoing, because to do this work, we necessarily had to make a lot of assumptions, right? CASA is uh, an effort that's underway, but CASA hasn't produced any results yet. We don't have any money, we haven't changed any laws, and it really is after you do those things that you will be able to start picking them up in a geographical analysis and see how you're doing. The idea is to have this work be ongoing uh, for the regional housing enterprise, so we, we pay special attention, as the name implies, uh, to these special or sensitive communities. Uh, just completing my summary of the document, uh, what you'll see on pages 42 uh, and 43 uh, are calls to action. Um, and I know several of you over the life of CASA have raised questions about, well, we need to talk about Prop 13, or we need to talk about lowering the voter threshold. Uh, and these are obviously very large endeavors that involve, in many cases, <coughs> amending the state constitution, uh, statewide votes and activity. And so we included these calls to action uh, as a way of capturing those ideas. Uh, they're clearly not in the level of detail that your compact elements are, but we didn't want to forget them either. Uh, and we expect that we'll be engaging in a lot of these over uh, the time. And finally, uh, the best place to look is probably in the memo at the outset. Uh, what you will see are a series of best practices uh, that we have identified in the Bay Area. And these are not the only best practices that exist, but our local governments uh, in this region have been doing a lot of innovation. Uh, they have been doing a lot of these strategies already, and we wanted to remark and, and lift up uh, places where this work has been going on uh, where the regional e exercise has learned from the local exercise and where I think, uh, I hope we would all acknowledge, we're going to be a lot stronger together uh, than apart. So I think, uh, right. Mr. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my summary. All right, I think you deserve a glass of water. Um, you know, as my uh, favorite ring announcer would say, now it's time to get ready to rumble. Um, we're going to start with getting everybody's kind of questions uh, as well as um, comments, and then we're going to ask everybody to register their vote along the gradients of agreement. I'm going to start with my colleagues here as co-chairs, and then we're going to work our way around the room so you don't have to raise a 10 or raise your hand. Everybody's going to get an opportunity uh, to weigh in. So, um, Leslie, where are you? I, where am I? <laughs> um, so I, I drew the straw, so I'm the first one uh, to vote. And I am voting a one. I've clearly been engaged in this for a very long time, but I also really believe in it. And uh, what I would share with you is that I have worked in this field, affordable housing, since I was 18 years old. And uh, I won't tell you how many years that is, but just suffice it to say it's been decades. Um, and we haven't solved it. In fact, it's, it's getting worse. So I, you know, I feel like I've done a lot of good things and a lot of people in this room have done good things, but it just hasn't, uh, it hasn't done the trick. And we need to, to do something completely different. That's why I'm really excited about this. We brought together people who 
are all passionate about this issue, but all have different concerns and different uh, ideas and solutions about how we respond to it. And we got people to come together and compromise and agree on on this uh, compact. And I I just uh, I think we've got to go for it. We've got to do it, and we've got to run with this. And I'm excited about implementation, and I'm hoping that that everyone else is is as excited as I am. Okay, so um, remember 18 months ago, we started off with, does anybody think we don't have a housing crisis? And of course, nobody didn't. So we agreed on that. We agreed that the three Ps were important, and they had to go down the whole track together, and we've done that. Uh, we agreed in the motto that we were housing the Bay Area. What does that mean? Well, certainly in the production side, it meant affordable, it meant missing middle, it meant other types of housing that are needed in different places. So it also meant that the, this compact was going to be, as you heard, again, 15 years and Northern California only. So all we have to do after we made all those agreements is do something that's never been done before. Get this group together that's never been in a room, uh, complicated, interwoven, multi-issue compact, but it had to move the housing agenda boldly down the field. So is it perfect? No. Will it solve it? No. Will it make a difference? I think it will. I think the issues that we have identified through long negotiations, uh, when we started 18, years ago, uh, 18 months ago, <laughs> um, it, it, uh, it, it has come a long way. And so, um, I think the perspective I have is, and, and as we've got it down to 10, is arguably every one of our compact issues, one through eight, has failed somewhere. Rent control failed with the Costa Hawkins 2.0. Uh, Just Cause failed at the legislature. ADUs failed in the last legislature. Um, streamlining has failed. 827 got, got beat up. Jerry Brown streamlining got beat up. All of these children, if you will, have been uh, waylaid by the side of the road. So what we said was if we put them all together and we don't let them break apart and we give them to the legislatures, which as you heard is the body that will take this down the freeway, um, there's a shot. And um, so I think that, that, that the, the final sort of concept here is that we all are passionate about the Bay Area. That You wouldn't be in the room if you weren't. Uh, the technical committee, as you heard, 28 to 1. Uh, there was a commitment to try to make this different. And I understand and have been in small cities, big cities, local authority is, is uh, secondary to none. But we're not trying to take it away. We're trying to modify it because we believe we haven't done a very good job as a region. So that's what this is. Tamika Moss was at the technical committee as a member, and her final comments were, when you look at this, think about that it does no harm. If it's not doing harm, you should vote for it if it's not in your field. So if, it's, if you're looking across and saying somebody got too much, somebody got too little, if you're, doing, if you're getting what you feel is a good progress, then that was the way she was recommending we look at it. So um, I think this can set a new attitude for the Bay Area. We do not have a regional approach. And it is a contradiction to local authority. But if we could come up with a way to get protection with the three items we've got, production with the five items we've got, the taxing will be a, a big effort on sausage making and picking the right taxes. We need to do public outreach. We need to do polling, all of those things that you are all familiar with. But at the end of the day, when it goes to those democratic bodies, assembly and the Senate, uh, it will hopefully come back with things that have held it together. We've told them that a dozen times. they got to go together. You can't drop three by the wayside. And I, I believe they get it, which is why they're sort of ramping up, and that's the good news. So my, my position for the efforts of the technical committee, my fellow co-chairs and the moderators, I think we got a one, so I'm a one. All right. Uh, thank you, Mike. I'll try to be brief, and then I want to um, hand it over to the other side of the room here. Um, you know, as I said before, this has been something that's been quite time-consuming. Uh, it's been very difficult, um, as you can see from the public comment, which I take very seriously. It has not made us the most popular people in the region. Um, and, you know, 
I, for one, um, even with all that work, didn't get everything that I want uh, in this. And uh, in spite of all of that, I sit here today uh, without an ounce of regret. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is, you know, I'm a, a Bay Area native. I grew up here. I've seen the way that things have changed. Uh, and over the last, um, I would say, four or five years or so, I have developed a pretty deep uh, disdain for the status quo. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is because it is very clear to me that the status quo is not working. Uh, I mean, I said this before, if, if you're somebody who is concerned about gentrification and displacement in your community, I think it's hard to say that the status quo is working. Uh, if you're somebody who uh, works every day on affordable housing development and want to see affordable housing at all levels of income in communities all across the region, the status quo has failed. Uh, if you are someone who is concerned about making sure that low-income people and people of color have access to the communities in the Bay Area that are rich with opportunity, uh, I think it's not hard to say that the status quo has failed. Uh, and so I don't think that uh, sticking with what we have been doing uh, is okay. And in fact, I think sticking with what we have been doing will make me angry. Uh, and so even if uh, this is something uh, that goes down in flames because it's too much of a press against the status quo, I will still have no regret. Um, what this process has been for the last 18 months to me uh, is something uh, that is in a journey in pursuit of something that I don't see people in pursuit of uh, very frequently nowadays when it comes to issues of importance, and that's common ground. Um, we are searching for the uncommon common ground across the different uh, areas of people that are working on stuff. Uh, and I think that this is the best attempt to do that. As I said, it doesn't reflect everything that I want. Uh, I take all the letters and uh, public comments very seriously, and so it clearly doesn't reflect uh, everything that everybody uh, else wants. Um, but again, uh, I think that the status quo is quite unacceptable. Uh, and so um, I'm at a one, and I'm at a one uh, with an assumption that all of this stuff uh, would go together. Uh, if for any reason uh, one aspect of this would uh, move forward uh, without another piece of it, I would, that would dramatically shift uh, the way that I would think about this. Uh, this is something where everybody can find something they don't like in it. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the beauty in it uh, is that it tries to take us to a higher level uh, where I'm hoping everybody will look at this as a complete package. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, I'm a one. What I, what I want to do, what none of us did, is we didn't ask questions. I think we know what's in the document. Yeah. Um, what I want to do is as we go around, if you have questions, we want to create the space for you to um, ask those, and we will try uh, our best to do that. But we also would like you to make a comment and then tell us where you are on the gradients. And we'll start over here with Mayor Schaff. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you, co-chairs. Um, it has been a Herculean task. Um, I will give the process a one. Uh, I will give the compact a two. And, and that is because, I mean, you should celebrate that. We should all be a little bit unhappy. Um, and I'll point out, you know, I would have probably liked the rent cap a little tighter. Uh, I am concerned about the, um, the three-year planning period um, for the sensitive areas, particularly because basically more than half of Oakland is a sensitive area, mm -hmm. and to actually execute that level of planning process in a three-year period, um, I'm not sure that we really have the bandwidth or resources to do that. But then, Fred, I might come knocking on your door for some help in that department. So that would be one of my questions. The question is what? Might there be some assistance available for, for municipalities that might not have the resources? 
Ha. Um, <laughs> I just said, might there be. So I absolutely will not take responsibility for uh, all of the um, cities in the um, <laughs> region that might need resources. But I will say um, that you know our foundation has been a part of an uh, uh, effort that includes uh, other philanthropies and other members of the uh, private sector called the Bay Area Partnership for All. And uh, we've been designing uh, a number of different funds, some focused in on getting more private money into the uh, development system, um, affordable housing development system, but also a policy fund uh, that would provide uh, support and technical assistance to local jurisdictions in the Bay Area that are attempting to do uh, the right thing across the three Ps. So that's something uh, that we are designing now and hoping to make an announcement about uh, um, in the early in the next year. Yeah, no, I uh, but it won't cover everybody, just yeah. to be clear. I I appreciate that, and just mayor will think about it. Would have been okay, but thank you for <laughs> that. That was that was very specific. Um, I, no, I appreciate that. Yes. Um, the the tax break um, in exchange for the streamlining. Uh, obviously, we were all very inspired by what we learned in New York. We also acknowledge that California has a much different tax system, and so I I um, while it makes me nervous. Uh, as long as, again, our commitment that this compact is a compact and that we will continue to gather the data and study it and analyze, you know, are these policies having the desired impacts? Um, I can get through my, my discomfort. Uh, and finally, the um, distribution of the revenues to the three Ps. I might have liked either a different distribution or some more flexibility among those categories, um, just as the six wins um, has brought up. But again, I trust that you have baked into this compact the discipline to constantly be collecting the data, analyzing how it is actually interacting with the real world once we get going, and the ability to adjust and shift over time as we see how things hit the ground. Um, so that those are the reasons that, that I'm, I'm kind of like a two, like almost a one. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, and then, you know, just my general comments. I think many of us around this table got to where we are because we are fighters. We are advocates. We are passionate about things. But today is the day to put down our raised fists and to hold hands. It is the day to really acknowledge, and if there is one thing that has become painfully clear to me during my four years as the mayor of Oakland, is that Oakland's problems are not Oakland's problems. That we are interdependent. That our status as residents of the Bay Area supersedes our status as members of any particular municipality with its random jurisdictional lines. And I certainly hope um, that particularly those of us who are here because of electoral politics um, that create pressures to pander to selfishness and exclusion, that we set aside those pressures and that we sit here not as elected officials but as leaders leaders that come um, to make a more equitable and better society. And we will not do that unless we resist those pressures and that we recognize our mutual interdependence. Thank you, Mayor Schaff. Um, we've got uh, Mayor Licardo on the phone, and I think he has to get off soon, so I'm going to interrupt the queue for a minute and invite him uh, for a comment. Well, thank you, Fred. I appreciate that. And I want to thank you and Leslie and Michael for your leadership uh, and your perseverance in pushing forward with what I think is uh, a really uh, uh, important, solid, and badly needed uh, set of proposals. Uh, I really appreciate the hard work of MTC staff as well. Um, I echo many of the things that Libby has said. Uh, I'm also uh, coming in at a two, uh, saying I, I believe strongly in the need to come up with a lot of comprehensive, uh, with a comprehensive set of solutions uh, that are inevitably going to make all of us unhappy. You know, there's no question that as we look at this, the cost 
uh, this collection of regulations, policies, taxes, and fees, and that cost is high. Uh, but the cost of not imposing a comprehensive set of solutions like these is intolerable. And we're simply at the place now where the cost of inaction is far too great and we, we've got to all push ahead. And so uh, I am happy to support this package. Uh, I won't bore everyone with a long list of nitpicky concerns I might have with any of these policies. I would just articulate uh, just two overarching concerns I have. Uh, one is I think that as I look at the shift, at the, the allocation of resources and policies, I, I think I would put more emphasis on production of affordable housing uh, and less on preservation and protection, whether it comes, for example, uh, on how we look at uh, policy, the, the item number five, uh, you know, restricting rezoning on sites with mobile homes, SROs, and public housing. You know, we're looking at sites right now in San Jose where we're coming to agreement with the mobile home uh, owners and residents on a way to significantly upzone the land, enable them to be protected, uh, to get their value and then some uh, to get a life estate and still be able to build more housing and more affordable housing. And so I, I hate the idea of just precluding uh, areas from, from upzoning. I'd much rather see how we can protect the residents who are there and still find ways to create more housing. Uh, I think about, for example, within item number nine of the list, you know, committing only 60% of the revenue to affordable housing production. I'd really want to see a much higher share going to affordable housing protect, uh, production and less to some of the other priorities. Uh, nonetheless, it's important that we do all these things. I'd be the first to admit. Uh, the, the second area of concern I have just generally is uh, I'm glad that Steve emphasized the word menu as he looked at the various items uh, in that chart that describe how we're going to generate this $1.5 billion annually of revenue. Uh, I think it's critically important for us to attach ourselves uh, to that target, but not to attach ourselves to specific menu items that are listed there. Uh, I think we're going to be in a different environment in 2020 when this comes up for a vote, as we hope many of these items will come before the voters. Uh, I think we all see the economic wind shifting. Uh, as we look at many of these taxes and fees, I think uh, many employers are going to be griping mightily that even though there's just one category for employers with a head tax and a gross receipts tax, in fact, many of these fees and taxes ultimately fall on employers as we think about, for example, commercial linkage fees. Uh, that ultimately get passed through to users, sales taxes, which are often paid in substantial percentage by employers in some jurisdictions as much as a majority, but in most uh, a significant minority. So, so many of these will fall on employers, and I think in 2020 the mood may be very different in terms of how we value jobs. Uh, so I, I think we need to think a little bit about that. I'd certainly support going to a larger share, for example, for sales tax or for RDA tax increment um, on, a, on a tax increment proposal. But, but those are details, obviously, we'll hash out through the legislative process. So in any event, I, I'm enthusiastically supporting uh, this comprehensive set of solutions, and I look forward to working with all of you to make it happen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it appears that my plan to go around the table is not lining up with people's schedules, and I, um, Supervisor Rabbit has to leave. So, Stuart, if you don't mind, um, just one more person cutting the queue. I will go to Supervisor Rabbit. Oh, thank you very much. I do have a 2 o'clock um, ABAG commitment. And I want to uh, just say, start off by just saying uh, what a fascinating and, uh, process that we have been through uh, by going in this direction and uh, convening this. And uh, I think as I can tell you, as an architect in the Bay Area for the last 30 years, I've worked all around the Bay Area. I've seen jurisdictions that work hand in glove to get something done. And I've also seen jurisdictions that don't. And that goes across different spectrums of size as well. Uh, I, I do think that we have a housing crisis, and I've said this before, I have um, you know, my children. Uh, I'm first generation in this country. Uh, my children, um, one who's a firefighter is, uh, soon to be wife, a nurse, they can't live in the Bay Area uh, currently unless I give them a down payment or a house. 
I think we, sh we, we do have a housing crisis. It supersedes the local control crisis that some people uh, believe there, there is. I do think that uh, what we're doing here is um, uh, pushing us to some out of, out of our comfort zone, but that's the only way that you really truly get any significant change going forward, and I think that we need to do that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a two uh, for a lot of the same reasons that have already been said. You know, I don't want to let, uh, uh, certainly don't want to let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. I think within each of the uh, pieces, we can nitpick the words. At the end of the day, what we're doing today is signing a compact, putting our names behind it, and sending it off to Sacramento where God knows what's going to happen. Uh, but I think that it'll give them the uh, courage as well to move in a direction. I do agree with Fred that it, the entire package is part of that direction because I think, again, there's something in there for everyone to love, something in there for everyone to hate. And, uh, you know, to me, that's actually pretty good governance, pushing us out of our comfort zone, uh, getting us on the edge a little bit, but actually trying to solve the problem instead of just kicking the can down the road or doing what we've been doing, which we know doesn't work. So I'm a two, and I'm looking forward to uh, everyone, hearing everyone else as long as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. All right, Stuart. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so I, I uh, am a, a two, a very enthusiastic two. Uh, I also have kids who are off in college looking to come back, as well as staff who are leaving the Bay Area. It's just out of control. And if we don't take a regional approach, we're not going to get it in control. Um, that said, uh, I. Uh, have also uh, received the uh, information from Six Winds and other uh, groups that are community-based and equity and really want to see a few changes in here. And I'd like to try to simplify some of the longer language and proposals that they have into a, a couple of very uh, modest uh, amendments. Um, the first one would be on those percentages uh, breakdown of how we would spend the revenue. Uh, I just keep hearing, uh, you know, different uh, amounts might be better for preservation especially uh, and I also think what the right uh, ratio is will change over time and we'll be learning during that time uh, and so I would put forward instead of playing with the numbers uh, get rid of the preface them which says right now up to X percent and then a minimum of and just say approximately 10 percent 10 percent 20 and 60 it me so it keeps the spirit I think that we, that's what we already have in there, is oh. it should be up to 20, up to 20, and, and at least 60. I, I want to get rid of the words up to. I want to say approximately 20, approximately 20, uh, okay. and approximately 60. I think it's helpful to have your concerns, and then we can talk through those rather than okay. have amendments that, because sure. this all requires, you just heard uh, you know, uh, Mayor Licardo say he wants more for production, and so I think we need to talk through this a yeah. little bit more. So um, I think it's clear that, that this topic of where those dollars goes is something that we need to spend a little more time okay, on. Okay, so it may change on the way to MTC and ABAG is what you're saying. Uh, maybe, uh, we also maybe didn't make that clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that wasn't um, clear, yeah. MTC and ABAG, we're going forward to them to ask their chairs to be signatories to this compact. This body, the steering committee, is taking the action today to approve this compact. So um, whatever advice that you are giving us today or questions or, or issues that you have, we will be working through uh, how we okay. respond to those. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Uh, I uh, thank you for that explanation. Uh, the deferment, I, I share the same concern. Uh, we do some planning with the city of Oakland and other cities, and uh, three years is not a long time for what would be a multitude of planning processes. So I, um, I think one that might want to be four or five years, and, and we really should specify that it will be resourced. When we did Resolution 3434, MTC was kind enough, Steve was kind enough to step forward with a hell of a lot of money for cities uh, to do that planning. Uh, and I think we should be expecting the same. Uh, and then uh, I'd, I'd like some uh, recognition of the complexity of uh, elements um, uh, six, seven, and eight, and how you know, not all of the stakeholders have really reached consensus about every detail in there. It really, when it comes forward, that's one of the things that Six Winds wants. It really feels like every height, every everything has been fully, you know, fleshed out. And uh, and so there's some some recognition uh, that uh, 
that there's not a full consensus maybe on every detail in there would be good. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to get around the table, but I understand Mayor Breed has a, 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 a scheduled conflict as well, so I want to make sure we get you in. So Mayor Breed. Thank you. Um, and uh, don't we always have a scheduling conflict around <laughs> here? Um, but I just want to thank you to um, all the uh, committee members and everyone here today for your hard work in coming up with the compact, which uh, provides, I think, really a guide for us to look at regional approaches to um, addressing what we know is a real crisis. And I think about um, just growing up in San Francisco, um, what happened in my community in the Western Edition, and how um, not only um, were there uh, places um, that didn't get built, lands of basically empty lots that weren't even touched for 40 years, so many you know, of my friends and family members couldn't afford to continue to stay in San Francisco because um, we just didn't do a good job around housing production. Um, and so we've had the conversations and we've talked about a number of issues and I think ultimately um, this is a, a great guide for us to begin pushing towards real regional solutions to address many of these challenges. And um, at this time, you know, I um, will agree with um, Mayor uh, Shaft in giving the process and, and, and this whole concept of coming together a one and the actual compact a two. And uh, for some of the, the concerns mentioned, but more importantly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my biggest concern, and that is um, the issues around uh, the sensitive communities concept, especially as someone who spent pretty much my entire life living and experiencing what it's like to be in one of those sensitive communities and seeing how redevelopment can be done wrong, um, but also having the experience of serving on the Redevelopment Agency Commission during a time where we were doing, you know, Alice Griffith in the Bayview, and that's redevelopment done right, promises kept um, in the way that we communicated and worked through the process in order to support that particular community. Um, I think that the problem I have is the delay, because oftentimes delay means denial. Waiting three years or anything of that nature to try and come up um, with, um, you know, just addressing those concerns don't, doesn't necessarily work for all communities. Um, it could potentially have worked for what we're dealing with in the Mission District in San Francisco, um, but not necessarily in the Western Edition or the Bayview, as, as, as we have seen with some of the things that we've implemented. And I think that there isn't a one-size-fits-all. And to um, put forth um, sensitive community concept where um, we are saying that the, um, you know, the plan is to hold off for three years and maybe there will be funding to develop the right plan of action, um, but in the process we lose out on the opportunity to develop that housing. And I don't want us to, um, you know, see opportunities escape communities when it's not necessary um, and putting a kind of a blanket uh, plan around areas where we know there are uh, places where there are communities that are very sensitive and, and concerned about displacement. I think that uh, what we've done in San Francisco um, to address this, and I'm really proud of the work that we did around neighborhood preference, and that's one of the things I think I brought up at the um, uh, CASA meeting that I uh, attended when I first got elected mayor, and one that I know has not necessarily been um, discussed in this plan, and I'm not necessarily advocating for any amendments or any delays to moving this forward. But more importantly, I think that the data um, will show with what we've been doing in San Francisco that it can be an effective tool in helping uh, to address some of those challenges with sensitive communities. So that is my biggest concern. Um, housing production should not be delayed. Um, yes, there are tons of process and procedure and sequels and everything else that already unfortunately delays housing uh, production which I think has created this mess in the first place and I just don't necessarily agree that um, this is really the right way to go and I um, would be open to looking at this on a case-by-case -case basis in the future depending on what happens as it relates to the policy that's brought forward. Um, and I also will continue to push for uh, support on a statewide level for neighborhood preference. 
I think it's an important tool to give people who live in those communities that are most impacted uh, preference for access to affordable housing built in their communities, which could not, you know, reverse the impacts of redevelopment in some neighborhoods, but can help, you know, move uh, uh, these projects forward with a real shot of those individuals having access to those units. Um, I also just want to mention that I think it's also equally important to ensure um, that people uh, who are building the housing that um, they get a fair living wage and that um, there are more opportunities to work with programs that uh, provide training and access to the jobs that exist as growth and development happens in San Francisco. We have programs like City Build and, and other uh, great opportunities to transition people who uh, traditionally may not have access to even a, a good paying job. We have the ability to um, invest in programs that will help with the opportunities that we're talking about because clearly um, if we're able to generate um, the, the revenue necessary um, to do all of what we're talking about in terms of housing production. Ultimately, I want those folks in these communities that we're talking about most impacted to be able to work and live in the community um, ultimately. And I want there to be a direct connection to that because I think that's one of the challenges that we also experienced in the past. So um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, thank you for uh, your work. And I, I wanna see a, a San Francisco and a Bay Area where people who grow up in these places can actually afford to live here. Um, I want there to be opportunities for, for all of us to grow and thrive in, in, in this region. And uh, housing production and not delaying housing production is going to be an important part of accomplishing that goal. Thank you, Mayor Breed. Mr. Matthews. I so rarely get to call it, be called Mr. Matthews, so thank you. For, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for, for your leadership and also for the technical team and staff uh, for actually slugging away at this every month for 18 months or 18 years. Uh, uh, this is a huge effort and it's really appreciated that um, uh, th there are a few things I want to touch on. Uh, I will say I'm a three and that's not, I'm going to change as an only child, I'm going to change definitions. That's one thing we do as children, 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 only children. Uh, that's not suggest for a status quo or abstaining or neutral in this. It is really meant to be we can go farther and faster and harder to have this goal. We're 400,000 units behind, as experts tell me. And so I'm concerned that while this is a hard uh, lift we've gotten to, um, as this process continues to the next level and the next level, hopefully we can continue to find ways to refine this, make this even stronger. And we're committed, I'm committed to helping to get me, us, to a one. So it's, we're not, this is a start. This is not an end uh, in any stretch. Uh, I'm a close to a two, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> if, well, with a few things, we could get there. We'll, we'll uh, give you 1.5. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but a couple of things have been mentioned that are, that are really important uh, that I want to mention here that I think could help make this stronger. One is obviously more in the production as, as the three mayors and others have talked about uh, on to really balance the three piece. I think there's been a tremendous work, great work on the other two um, and commendable and laudable and but I think it's it, more faster in the production be really critical at this point. Oh, well, okay, well, very degrees. Um, the, the other uh, piece of this, I noticed at the end and Steve, I thought it was great you added in terms of the calls to action um, I think there would be a way of how to integrate that into this even more profoundly. Just not, I, I'd be worried that those are important things that could be viewed as an afterthought, and I know they're not. But I think some way to find those, those are really critical things to, I think, getting us to where we need to do as a call to action. I think it's well labeled, but maybe it's more refinement on that. And then, um, and, I'll, and I'll stop here real quick, but with one thing about, uh, Mayor Licardo mentioned about the revenue side, and I appreciate that this is changed to a menu uh, which is helpful. One of the things I want to mention here as a uh, representing a large employer, I know the other low employers here as well as us and others who aren't here have done and contributed a lot to housing and efforts and coalition with other folks and people at this table and will continue to do so. What I worry is if there uh, might be, it, because there's going to be these taxes as well as other taxes like this for transportation coming down the pike here and other things, that there's possibly a disincentive for others to step up to the table to f work in partnership with cities and small towns and their local communities to do even more 
and coalition that we're driving to real partnerships. So if there's some way to do, whether it's credits or it's incentive, or somehow find a way to m work that into there, the, that would be, I think, really a strong way to encourage. I mean, we'll be there regardless, but if there's some way that that could be really more profoundly in there. Thank and, um, you. Yeah, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Council Member Collins. Thank you. And uh, again, I will uh, thank you for leading us. Uh, appreciate the amount of, probably don't appreciate the amount of hard work that you all have done, that our technical committee has done, that the staff has done. Uh, I think it shows, but it probably doesn't show as much hard work as you have done. Uh, lots of meetings, lots of thinking. Uh, very much want to appreciate that. I also want to appreciate the hard work of people sitting behind me who have been following consistently what we have been doing, who have been making comments, who have been sort of bringing to light some of the issues that we've needed to focus on a little more, uh, including six wins and uh, the cities such as Pat Eklund. Uh, I think that um, we're in the unenviable position of wanting to talk about the devil in the details while presenting something with a broad brush to Sacramento so that they have opportunities to work on it. And I find that, uh, you know, the, the, the person with the engineering background in me has a lot of difficulty with that, letting something go with just the broad brush strokes and not having the details in it. Um, that said, <laughs> uh, I, I I am now agreeing with reservations. I could, uh, I think, easily slip to a disagree because of these reservations, but I'm, I'm feeling very hopeful and positive that we can move forward. So I am, I am listing myself as a two, agreeing with reservations. Some of my more serious reservations regard issues that have been brought up by Six Winds and Pat Eklund, including uh, the need to improve municipal engagement uh, the need to improve our public engagement. It's really hard to explain this in an elevator speech. Uh, CASA is tough to explain to people what it is, what it does, what it, wh where it's going. Um, we, need, we really need to work on some of that. Uh, it concerns me that we are essentially skipping uh, entities that are representative entities such as ABAG, MTC, and RPC. I appreciate that we're talking with chairs of these bodies, but we didn't really talk with the bodies as a whole, and that, that is a concern of mine. I think that's a fixable concern. We can go and get that information, but I think we still need to do that. I really want to appreciate that the cities need dollars for planning and data collection. I appreciate that we have the choice of opting or not opting uh, to look at the communities of concern. Um, I also want to appreciate a piece of education that I've received here. Uh, I have to admit that I started as the kind of advocate who would have said, let's deal with the people 30 AMI and lower. Uh, let's do with the lowest income people. Uh, this, our city's need for funding in that area is tremendous. It's the most costly to build. What I hadn't really grappled with was that our market housing does not meet middle income housing. And so I now, I think through this process, fully understand the missing middle argument and am more prepared now to discuss um, how we deal with average AMIs or even AMIs up to 120, 150 um, in a way that I was not prepared to move forward when I entered the room 18 months ago. Uh, so I, I want to appreciate staff's work on that and their, their willingness to persistently educate me. Um, I am concerned that only element two and three have the word emergency in their title, and I would hope that we would refine and edit that. Because element two and three have the word emergency in their title and the other elements do not, but the entire document is to be reviewed because of emergency in 15 years, it feels like those are targeted to be removed in 15 years. I appreciate that may not be the intent, but it is implied because those have the word emergency. So either everything has emergency or nothing has emergency. If you don't mind my asking for that small editorial change, it is so clear to me that all 10 of these elements must move forward together. As a city, I cannot go along with some of the provisions of better government without having the funding come forward. 
so I, I very much want to speak for making sure things are moving on together. I want to emphasize the flexibility and the percent allocation as needed. Uh, I, you heard there was some discussion here. Obviously, uh, rather than having us make in concrete percentages, I would just like for there to be some flexibility in the percentages. It is my personal perception, based on the work that I've done as an engineer in building codes and construction for a number of years, at least by training, um, that it is much harder to get the protection and the preservation elements that there are um, more well-organized entities that will help move the production sections forward. And the funding is really needed in the preservation and protection sections. Um, I think SB 50 shows that uh, we have a problem already with uh, not being double joined at the legislature. It is not double joined with protection and preservation. I hope that we can work with the, the, the legislature to move that forward. I had also hoped for a tighter rent cap. Uh, CPI plus 5% is very much higher than the going rate almost any of the cities that have this, uh, but I will take what I can get. Um, I'm very sorry that we did not have a no net loss policy or an anti-harassment policy come forward with the tenant protection section. Uh, and I would like to see us work on that in the future. Uh, I'm hoping that we can work together in some form in the future on something similar. So following our fires in Santa Rosa, where we lost about 5,000 homes, um, we became keenly aware that the housing crisis that we had had prior, where we had less than 2% vacancy rates and we were already experiencing displacement, became amazingly critical. Um, I'm proud that since those fires, our city has adopted between six and seven of the elements that are in this package. I'm seeing them beginning to work now in our city. I am excited to see them move forward. Um, I hope we can continue to work together and to work with Sacramento, and I want to appreciate the process. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kofi. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first and foremost, congratulations to the leadership team here in MTC and co-chairs. Uh, I will say that when uh, we started this process, I had a, I would say, a healthy cynicism as to see whether we could ever get to this point, and here we are today. And certainly the technical committee members, uh, I don't know how you've done it, but you've been able to do it. And again, thank you all for the work. Um, you know, there are countless volunteers, I presume, that have worked within these, with the technical committees, and I'm sure many of them are here today, and I also want to thank them, because they certainly have come to the table to comment and maybe argue, and perhaps compromise, which is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've worked, m much of my career has either been on the uh, public side, uh, 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 negotiating uh, with developers or as a developer negotiating with the uh, public sector and I've negotiated a few development agreements and community benefit agreements and the the goal of those kinds of agreements is to balance the needs of the community in which you wish to develop but to incentivize the development and I believe that what we've done here or what you've been able to do in this compact is really do that on the regional level which is obviously critically important. So uh, in the spirit of getting more than I thought we would ever get, I am at a one. Um, I will say that uh, I anticipate that this compact will, as it moves through the legislative process and more and more people get engaged, we'll uh, see some twists and turns. And I too would like to urge and support the need for the compact as a whole to move forward. I think that's really critically important. I do believe that the need to uh, preserve the sensitive communities and protect the tenants, balanced with the production of more housing, they're all symbiotic needs, and they're not competitive, they're actually complementary. And if you think about it, in the past, we've been looking in this region generally as those items being competitive. And I think that in some respects has uh, brought us to the crisis we're in today. So I am very pleased that we are here. I think that there are many, many items in the compact that are great beginnings for the legislature to really sort of dive into, and that's really key. Uh, I would say in terms of one uh, sort of comment and suggestion is, in listening to the commentators and certainly reading through the, 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 the materials that were sent 
I do believe that we have to pay attention to the sensitive communities map. It sounds like we're on version 57. We may have to get to version 100. I don't know. But what is critically important is that we get to a map that there's broad, uh, a broad sense of agreement that indeed we've captured where pl the places that may have the most impact because as I think you said, uh, Tamika Ma said, we have to be sure that this compact does no harm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I c salute and commend everybody that's worked on this. Thank you, Kofi. Supervisor. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start off this way. Um, this is probably going to be my highest number here, um, as I explained, but I want, I want to give um, the chairs and, and the staff that the staff this a one for the process that we charged you with primarily, which was to come up with this product, but also included managing a, a group here, which as an elected official over the last uh, 26 years, um, I would have to say uh, this is probably about double the size of the largest group I ever worked with on a specific plan or land use or anything else. I, you know, we used to have a saying, and, and I still abide by it, that once you get above about 24 people, you're not going to get anything done. So uh, somehow uh, you've managed to do that, and, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, that said, I, I feel like I kind of whiffed on something as somebody who was um, – uh, in a in a significant leader pos leadership position 18 months ago when this started, and that is, um, I think besides a technical committee and a steering committee, we should have had an outreach committee as well. And, and I think what's happened is because of a lack of, of that, um, there's this in entire external community out there of folks um, who are not only impacted, but basically have a lot of power um, over what happens with this in the future um, that um, you know, really haven't, haven't had a place like that uh, to go. And I'm not, that again, you can look squarely right at me for not uh, realizing uh, at the time uh, that I should have made the case for that because I think probably given the position I was in 18 months ago, I, I, I could have prevailed and, and made sure that happened. I think it raises some, some concerns and it's hard to find over, my, I'm going to give you my overall recommendation uh, in a couple minutes here, but it, it really is, it really creates kind of a hybrid, um, you know, level of agreement for me. Um, and you know, let, me, let me just kind of put it this way. Um, you know, Tip O'Neill was probably one of the most bold uh, speakers uh, of the House that we've, we've had in, in modern history. But he also wrote a book called All Politics is Local. And, and there was a, a great little vignette in that book uh, where he's talking about the fact that he wanted to walk precincts after he'd already decided to retire but his last for his last two-year term. He was going to go back and, and, and walk the precincts for the first time in, in decades and just do it again and knock on doors. And as he was, he was coming home from his own precinct, and I'm paraphrasing the story, of course, uh, but as he was coming back to his own house after one of those walks, he decided to walk up to his neighbor's door um, an older woman who, who, was, who was there answered the door, um, and he had a chat with her. Um, and then he said, look, you know, I hope you're going to support me again. And she said, what do you mean again? <laughs> and he, he said, what do you mean? I just assume we're neighbors, we're friends, we've gotten along, you know. Um, you haven't been supporting me all this time? And she said, Tip, you never asked. And she said, you got to ask. you got to look somebody in the eye and ask them for support. Um, and, you know, I think many of us in, in local office are here also uh, for that reason because we've learned over time that you, you have to do that, that you have to have that two-way communication. And we this thing about not having external outreach accomplished yet, and, and, and I, I understand that will happen, um, but not, hap not having happened up till now really defies all, all of that kind of advice. People, you know, by analogy or just carrying out that, that example or that metaphor, uh, out in uh, elected officials in 101 cities and nine counties, 
um, need to be looked in the eye and they need to be asked, you know, to support what's going on and to, to buy in and to have that two-way communication. So I, I don't think it's doomsday because that hasn't happened yet, but I think it's, it's definitely problematic for some of us who are elected officials to, to sign on to language that explicitly says, I will go along with the will of the group. Um, back when I get to my own county, my own county is saying, uh, you know, or a colleague in Berkeley or someone else is saying, hey, do I get a chance to tweak this? Um, well, you know, I already said I'm going along with the will of the group. It, it, it creates a little bit of a, of a problem for folks like me, and it's not because I don't want to be bold. I do want to be bold, and I endorse the fact that uh, especially the technical committee has been bold up to this point and created a menu um, that is extensive and it is a good toolkit. I think the compact is good. So I'm mostly satisfied with the tools that have been brought forward and, and assembled and, and even the choices uh, for on the revenue side, even though I, I do have reservations about that. Um, but I have what we don't really have here is a category that says I'm mostly satisfied, but I have serious reservations. Um, that would really be a combination of two and four. Um, I think probably that should have been number three. I'm mostly satisfied, but I have reservations, and maybe neutral and abstain should have been number four. But that's, that's where I'm at, and um, I think where that, that puts me is a four. Um, because I, I can't put me at a two. I would have to say I'm mostly satisfied and I can support uh, the decision. If I were to support the decision, then the, the issues that I think will come up when that outreach is accomplished um, as this process goes on, um, like revenue displacement for local governments, um, those, that's a huge issue. The two issues, I, I don't know if you know, first of all, I want to thank all the private sector folks here who have actually been extraordinarily generous with, yeah, maybe we can do this, maybe we can do that, things that I never thought I'd see, especially big businesses, go along with. Um, but I hope, I don't know if, if, if people outside of elective office um, who have been primarily private sector folks understand that when you do go out and talk to the locals, um, on a one-by-one on -one basis, trying to get majority support from city councils and boards of supervisors, the two areas they're going to be most concerned about are revenue displacement, and that's just a, a huge deal here, um, and governance. I, I actually think that the local control issues that are present here are pretty, pretty minor overall. We, we're got, we're going in that direction. We're going to need to go in that direction, and. To, to any of my peers listening here, you know, I, I think the days of pure local control are probably over in terms of local government. But when you're going in and saying we want money, we want to display some of your capacity for money, and um, you know, we've got an uncertain governance for what we're going to do with that money, um, we got a lot of, that's, those, are, those are huge, huge issues, uh, as in, um, I, I just don't want to see things go up in smoke. So that work needs to be done. I do want to throw in um, two little, um, you know, sort of support and objective, ob objection comments in terms of calls to action. County boards of supervisors, and, you know, the counties, and I think this is all of them. Um, if I'm wrong, someone can correct me from, from wherever um, they're in disagreement have supported since the dissolution of RDA, not a restoration of all RDA, but a restoration of the 20% that was going to housing. And it, we didn't really call it out that way, and I'm fine, I'm, I'm going along, I'm not, <laughs> I understand that's one of those things that you may, you may not like a lot, but you go along with. And the other thing is I just want to say, relative to the HDC, which Steve talked a little bit about, um, sort of the New York model, um, I think that has to be pursued. Um, I would endorse that with a one right now. Um, and I think we need to, you know, get off the starting blocks and start creating a, a housing development corporation um, very similar to the model that, that they're using in New York um, as fast as we possibly can. Um, it is a non-governmental agency. It's not constrained by 
uh, a lot of uh, the competitive bidding issues and other issues that we have to go through under state law. Um, and it, it, it really has, um, uh, as a public benefit corporation, which is the model they use, the ability to be very nimble and to accrue profits, um, which local governments and regional governments and state governments just can't do. We're just, we're not allowed to profit. We're only allowed to do cost recovery. So that, I hope, will get a lot more attention in the future. Thank you. Sorry to take up so much time, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land on four. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, we're at 2.10, and we have seven more people. Are people okay to um, give me the 2.30? I'm particularly looking at this side of the table. Uh, you, you already running late? Okay. Um, so I'll ask folks to speed up as well. Thanks, Fred. I, I uh, want to thank you, and I want to thank all the folks that were on the committee that made this happen. You did a great job. There's a huge cost of doing nothing uh, on this particular problem. Um, we have a lot of successes in the Bay Area, but if we don't meet this challenge, uh, there's huge failures. And uh, the lower you are on the economic ladder, the greater the failure affects you. And so we have a huge call to the individuals that have not reaped the benefits. And so I, I really applaud your leadership uh, in getting us here. And I think uh, I've got the local government folks on my shoulder for two reasons. One, I used to work in local government, three different jobs. And two, I just came out of 2923, the passage, which was congratulations, Grace. Here's your crown and here's your cape. You get to zone the world away. And all, all we did is give us a bunch of enemies. You know, they thought they were enemies, and it, whereas they were allies before. And so I've got to turn that around. And that's what we have to do here. We have to do the same thing. We have to turn around to local government and say, look, we, we got this forward. We needed a problem statement. Fred, you said we need to press against the status quo and we need to get to a higher level. And, and I would say we needed a problem statement and we needed some suggested solutions. And we did that. And you guys did a great job leading us through. And I really give a lot of credit to the folks sitting over here for that. But that's an imperative for us. We have a nice mix of local elected officials and uh, appointed or other officials, the nonprofits. The, the comment made that local government isn't represented here. Given the volume of folks here, there are many people here from local government, cities, counties, there's, you know, uh, and the, there's some small, uh, smaller jurisdictions that are here. So it's hard. There's no other transit agencies, you know. Uh, it's the way it goes. We, uh, everyone's, I think, doing their best. But um, at the root of this, I think, is Prop 13 from years ago, and that's gotten us here. And if you're an elected official, you can't touch that. Okay, I get that. The rest of us can. And I so appreciate your calls to action on homelessness and your calls to action on Prop 13. I th think that they were very uh, important to have. I, I do want to hear what Bob Alvarado has to say on the labor side. When it comes to the uh, fixing of local problems, we we're always first to go to uh, the, I think in Prop 6, if I recall, the carpenters put in $3 million on a campaign that was about $40 million. It was a disproportionate burden they carried to stand up to the plate and fix the problem. So I think we should hear what they have to say. And to the local elected officials, they have to face this every single day. And this is a regional problem that's tough to face locally. So giving them some strength. And, and tw to be honest, 29-23 was kind of a lecture from the legislature back to all of us to fix something. And so I just think it's an opportunity. And so back to the point, we, we need to have a next step here where we we go back to the local government and work it. I don't know if it's a subcommittee of CASA that meets with ABAG as a representative or we go on a tour with some of the s smaller jurisdictions, as was mentioned. But it's a step that's got to be taken for us to be successful. Thank you. Number. So what was your Grace. score again? Grace. Two. Two. All right, thank you. Matt. I only didn't give it a one because I'm a, uh, I report to nine boards, Absolutely. nine member board, and I'm sure <laughs> there's not perfection in it for all of them. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to be very quick here. Uh, I am, uh, I think, a two minus. Is that the closest to one? A very enthusiastic two. Uh, <laughs> And um, before I before I offer just very brief comments, I want to I, I want to thank the co-chairs. I want to thank the the working group moderators. You've all uh, put a lot of serious time into this. And I want to particularly thank Steve Heminger uh, as the leader of, of the MTC and Jake McKenzie and Dave Rabbit. Uh, collectively, you've shown a lot of vision uh, to embrace talking about transportation and housing together. Uh, you, you've had a long, great career in transportation, Steve. I think enormous impact and a lot of, a lot of bruises and cuts to show for it. In the sunset of your tenure, you didn't have to tackle uh, an effort like this. Uh, 
and Jake is the chair of the MTC to tackle this. It, it really shows a lot of vision. Uh, and I just really want to thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, um, I, uh, I, I am one of the things I uh, really appreciate about the moment that we're in in the Bay Area right now as somebody who spent my career in affordable housing uh, is that we spend most of our time talking about solutions and not having to convince people that we have a crisis. I'm hearing here some, some, still some public comment and question about a crisis, but as a general matter in the Bay Area, it's about solutions. And this is a really robust set of solutions, and one that I think uh, everyone who's worked on has brought a very, very serious uh, effort, and a lot of their uh, talent and treasure has been put into, into creating this. And so I, I, I very much uh, uh, appreciate that. I, I think, you know, I think a piece that I'm, most appreciative of is, you know, MidPen, we're very clear. We feel like we work on all three of the P's. And I feel that the tenant protections in here are very, very strong. And, a, and I appreciate the six wins from the very beginning kind of anchoring us in not just the three P's, but I think we had specific instruction from the beginning that they went in the order of protection, preservation, and production. Uh, and and I, this is a robust set. And I I would also like to just single out as a as a as illustrative for me of the spirit of all this was uh, watching uh, Mike Covarubias in particular and Denise Pinkston really take seriously bringing a lot of market rate owners and developers into this process who clearly understood what they were here for and and have weighed in with scores that are supportive of these protections and so I think that's an enormous. Uh, the Bay Area will be a lot better place if we can if we can implement just cause, uh, rent cap, and and um, access to council. I would endorse Steve's suggestion or Stuart's suggestion about switching to the approximately language. The circumstances change over time, and I think that's in keeping with the spirit of the work we've done here. Um, you know, we the the report also does a really nice job of sizing the problem. Uh, making us all realize it's going to take serious resources to solve it. So we've got some hard work ahead of us to try to figure out how to raise those resources. Um, the, the, the one reservation I have, and I'll be brief with it, it relates to element seven, and that element has gotten a lot of hard work and a lot of movement towards a good direction. I'm really in support of the principles behind it. I, I think a streamlining, a serious streamlining effort would be, would be important to, to our solution package. Um, I um, uh, would be very excited about a, a program that could really unleash the market to produce uh, affordable units as well as market rate at some volume. I'm intrigued with using some tax abatement. My, it's a detail, but an important one. Others have spoken, spoken about uh, we still have a really deep level of specificity, in this case, about the amount of the benefit that would be conferred to the developers for doing this in the form of tax abatement, 100% for the, for the affordable units, 50 to 75 for the market rate units of a 15-year of a tax abatement. I, I've never seen the math behind that equation of the benefit you know, given in the abatement relative to the public benefit generated. I've talked to every affordable housing finance person who's been part of this process and who works on these questions all the time. They've never seen the math behind that either. So I just think it's problematic to, to ask this group to embrace spe specific calculations that we haven't had the benefit to, to really talk through. Um, but I uh, would reiterate that I am a two minus very enthusiastically, minus in the sense of very close to one. Thank you. Uh, hi, okay. I'm a one. I'm, I'm an, unrec I'm an unrepentant. One, <laughs> when Steve Hammer, Hemminger, pa you know, passes from this daily strife, you will find engraved upon his heart, CASA. So thank you, Steve. I told him that earlier on today, so this doesn't come as a surprise to him. How many voting members are there on, on this group? Uh, how many? 21, you failed Parkinson's law test, no more than 20. but. Uh, I get a sense that we're getting uh, uh, pretty close. 
I would never, ever have had a three, neutral or abstain. That's chicken shit, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> don't, go, don't go with that at all. Uh, I'll be bringing this in front of MTC. I just want to say, for people who have not been paying attention, that we in, at MTC have been getting briefings on the CASA Compact. We do represent cities. We do represent counties. I come from a city of 43,000 people. We build houses in Runner Park. We have a general plan. We implement it. We have specific plan areas. We have development agreements with developers. Lo and behold, houses get built. It is not an impossible task to build housing, even in smaller cities. So having said all of that, I have an analogy that uh, I'm, I'm going to launch. Uh, I was sitting watching uh, the Hudson River last week, and I landed in this country as an immigrant 54 uh, years ago on the Royal Mail ship Queen Mary. Queen Mary would then turn around and sail back to Southampton to the land of Brexit. Um, but what I'm saying to you just now is that there is a ship that has sailed already. The, cap, the captain of that ship is, is about to be changed as it leaves the harbor, and there will be a new governor the first week of January. There's a, a, a new legislative crew on that ship. They started work already, and if we, as people who are in the business of working cooperatively in this region, and, and we're a regional effort, we're not parochial, when I leave Sonoma County, I take the smart train through Marin. I get on a ferry, or I get in a Golden Gate bus, and I come to San Francisco. I go out to, to visit my brother-in-law in Pleasant Hill, and I know about these things. I have a daughter who lives in Utah because she couldn't afford to live in the Bay Area, but thanks to the city of Oakland, I have a son who, through first buyer home policies, was able to buy a house uh, 10 years ago in Oakland. So I'm well aware of all these things. I've been here in the Bay Area since 1964. I drove till I qualified in Sonoma County. So all of these things are very real personally. But as the chair of MTC, uh, I am committed to bringing this in front of MTC. I think it is the right thing to do. Um, I, I understand that it's very uncomfortable when you read the pledge to support the entire agreement and all of its provisions. But I'm a pragmatist, and I know when this compact is delivered to the legislature, and they're well aware of its contents, that there will be a legislative process. Our legislative committee will review whatever pieces of legislation. This is not static. This is not a compact that's going up and, and coming down off Mount Sinai, you know, carved into bloody stone tablets. We all know that. So um, let's be reasonable when we think about that but, that, but let's be courageous and let's take risks. This is an emergency. This is an emergency. Thank you very much. One. Thank, thank you, Ellen. And as we come down the back stretch, I just want to say thank you all for your patience down this on this end of the table. Appreciate I'm, it. I'm going to try to keep it brief. Um, so I appreciate the pragmatism. I'm also a pragmatic person um, and have my vote is in spirit of common ground. Um, and uh, some, some of people have alluded to an, a trip to New York and hearing about their housing plan. And what struck me was when we started the morning listening to the deputy mayor talk about their housing plan and it was great. And the last panel of four folks did not think the same way of the New York's housing plan. And my takeaway um, was, I hope in five years when people ask us about CASA that we don't have that great of a divide, right? And I think there are minor details that people brought up that are gonna be worked out in legislation. And I think we all agreed to stay at a high level to allow the state legislative process to do that. However, I think there are still some major points that if we land them, we can close some of the divide. And that is 
and I don't know how the co compact gets changed. Like I've been in this at every steering committee meeting. I was in negotiations, and I I feel like it. It's generally the same, but they're moving targets. And you know, I make comments at every steering committee meeting, and don't necessarily s see my comments reflected. So um, that the protection policies need to be put in place before the production policies get implemented. And I think it's really critical that that is actually articulated within those provisions that that happens. Um, and I think because the state is, legislators are going to do what they're going to do, that we need to land a map. And that goes back to our do no harm principle. And right now, we don't know if this does harm or not, right? Because the equity analysis that we've been talking about for six months, we just received a few days ago, and it's very peripheral. So I, I can't vote on this and say, yes, we're moving forward, we're common ground, and we're not doing any harm. Because there's no backup to have that. And so I think landing a map together, and I think there's a new draft that the geography group developed unfortunately sent out like last night <laughs> you know so it's it is constantly changing and i'm not quite sure like okay we're voting on this version so there's another version that's going to go to mtc and a bag i don't know what version is going to show up at the signing ceremony like you know it <laughs> like i but those are two pieces that i feel like can can close the gap a little bit and um i think make a few of us sleep a little easier once this compact moves forward. And so with, you know, I have to vote a four until I see those actually um, documented in the compact. Thank you. Dave. Well, good afternoon. Um, so just to get to the bottom line, I will vote two on the report and just a, a little bit of a rationale. I, I don't have an elegant story like the good Scotsman to my left about how I got to California. You know, you're an Irishman, you've got to have a story. <laughs> but, you know, it then would include profanity and it wouldn't be appropriate, so. <laughs> right. Um, but I've been here 10 years and look, all you gotta do is walk outside it's much worse now than it was 10 years ago. If I just count the tents that I see in the morning riding from El Cerrito to Oakland to go to work, there's hundreds of them. Those did not exist 10 years ago. We are in a crisis. This is not a theoretical problem. This is not some hypothetical issue we're talking about. We have tens of thousands of people who have nowhere to live and we have millions of people experiencing real deprivation because housing is taking up a, a half of their income, as we heard earlier from some of the speakers. My reservations, I, I frankly think the least of it is the details contained in the compact. I think the real issue, and as much as, you know, in some ways we talk about this is we're the deciders, we're not the deciders, we are the recommenders. And this is going to go to a legislature that is going to appreciate our feedback or input, but if any of them feel bound by it, I'll be shocked. I think what our real role here is to create and help create a crisis for the state legislature. The fact that we're handing this off to the state legislature by definition means the problem is bigger than us. We can't solve the problem. The problem was not created by the region and it cannot be solved by the region or any of its subordinate jurisdictions in any real way. And to think otherwise is, I think, just fantasy. Look, my view is, you know, the housing situation in California is a massive public policy failure. And so all of this comment about we need more quote unquote democracy, that's what produced this problem. And saying we need years more of this 
is going to make it more intractable, not less intractable, because every day there are more people in tents. And so if we're going to get at this, I think the most important contribution here is that this was a regional process. Because the bigger the platform, the closer you're getting to be able to solve it. Every time we get down to a county or a municipality, we are getting further and further away from what's effective and what's actionable, in my opinion. And I think what I would hope we go forward with when we hand this off is that we all bear in mind that at the end of the day, this problem, if it's going to be fully dealt with, is a, it has to be done at the statewide level. Proposition 13, statewide issue. All sorts of you know, inputs here, statewide policy matters, and we are always trying to solve this with one arm tied behind our back if we're not operating at a statewide level. And I hope as we incorporate in this in the rollout, the implementation, and the execution that we're also mindful that we need to, you know, be on other regions, other counties to join the band because that will help us. If this is limited to the Bay Area, it's, either, it's easy for the Southern Californians to say, you know, okay, we really don't have skin in this game. I think the one, my biggest criticism is we should be more intentional and more explicit about part of the work is making the case to the rest of the state of California that was not part of this process, which was certainly good enough in my view and that we should think about how do we build out where we, the, the biggest thing is not that we need to go deeper into our 101 cities in the Bay Area, is how do we go wider to the 45 counties that aren't incorporated in this because that's how we'll ultimately solve this, so thanks. Thank you. Supervisor Carson. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, first, I want to thank, I want to thank the leadership for uh, pulling us all together. I know this it was a Herculean task uh, and I appreciate uh, that. Uh, the work that the tech group did and the staff, so I really want to say that. I'm a number two, so let me just put that out there right off the bat. Uh, I agree with reservations. Um, I appreciate the attention that was given, especially in the area of preserve and protect, uh, especially to uh, consider how we further protect our citizens, our seniors, our ethnic groups, our economic diversity, disparity groups, um, the marginalized communities that are here to try to keep them at least in uh, in their own home some kind of a way. Uh, is it an answer? No, it's not a complete answer, but I, I really appreciate moving in that direction in the way in which we have. Uh, in the other areas of attention, I think, and interest are in the areas of producing um, with, with respect to inclusion as we talk about the areas of produce. Inclusion and making sure that uh, the workforce that goes forward to try to, uh, to construct uh, all of this, these new homes uh, is more inclusionary, and that means that, that the people who have also been marginalized in some of these areas are returning citizens from uh, some of our institutions, uh, individuals who are in the safety net who feel a sense of hopelessness are part of, of the, uh, the part of producing, uh, along with the existing workforce, the training and everything else going towards that. I'm also a little bit concerned with respect to the regulatory issues and environmental issues going forward. I do think that we need uh, to figure out a way to streamline, and I think that's a delicate balance in how we do that. Um, but I think uh, that there is some still concern in that respect for me. I, I do believe also that there is an opportunity for the democratic process to continue to operate uh, for individuals who do not feel they've been included. This is a product. Uh, this is a compact. It is something that puts it into a package deal that clearly has to navigate city uh, county, uh, le the legislative processes that are still before us, and I still think there's some opportunities there. So again, um, number two, I want to apologize for my other um, board members um, because I'm going to have to leave. So I apologize. Thank, Thank you, you Supervisor. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Alvarado. <laughs> well, I've, unfortunately or fortunately, I've had a lot of practice about, uh, about being the bastard child at the family reunion. <laughs> Um, but I have a question on process, and then I have a couple comments. Uh, the process has been that we've had these discussions, and then the chairs and the moderators uh, go back and, and put it down and, and then bring it out. So that um, 
you know, we're being asked to vote on something today, but we don't know which comments are going to be taken in or, or other, other um, issues that have been brought forward. We really don't know what's going to make it into the, into like the final draft. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little concerned about that. Just saying that though, um, conversations we've had over the last uh, week or so, I'm, I'm probably going to move the most upwards. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was the only five um, because there were some things that just were not included uh, in the pack. Um, but since then, we've, you know, we've made significant progress. Um, I'd like to um, echo uh, one of my fellow um, members of the, of the committee in saying that I could probably move up to a strong two from a three to a strong two. Um, but again, like uh, uh, Supervisor Carson, I think you know, as we go forward, as we get into the MTC and, uh, and uh, ABAG levels, um, we need to start focusing on, on uh, again, workforce development, especially local hire in those disadvantaged communities. Uh, it's worked well in Oakland. It's worked very well in San Francisco. worked very well in Richmond. And it's worked very well in San Jose. Those places where we have an opportunity uh, to, to establish pre-apprenticeship programs um, make a big difference. And they're better apprentices. We have over an 85% retention rate when an apprentice comes out of an inner city uh, pre-apprenticeship program. So there is opportunity there for folks to move into, into the trades. Um, and so that's going to be one of our, my projects on the local level. But I think uh, as it reaches the MTC and ABAG, we want to put that out there. And the second is just kind of a, a cautionary note. I had a couple of meetings. Um, we, I think um, the, the chairs and the, or the co-chairs and ABAG and MTC need to find out who is going to author. Um, we put forth this redevelopment too. Um, we need to find out who's going to author that bill because when you look at some of the financing things that we have, again, the 15-year tax rebate, that used to go to, to fund redevelopment. You know, that's where most of the dollars that came out of and the opportunities came out of redevelopment. And so we need to be cautious that there's not a lot of big pushback and we don't, we don't sacrifice um, RD2 just because of what we're trying to do here. Um, so, um, you know, I was a five. I was looking at a three uh, today with possibly going to two, um, but I really would like to see the, f the final draft yeah. of this thing before I cast the vote. So I'm um, a three going to two um, with Thanks. a look-see. Understood. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Arian, it thank was you. Jake's stunning speech. Thank that you. Turned me around. Thank you, Arian, for your patience. By the way. Okay, so I guess I'm bringing up the rear on this one. Um, you know, I, I I'm a second generation Bay Area native, and I have been disheartened by the regional transportation and housing crisis that we've been experiencing here and continue to experience here. And, you know, I see, I've been disheartened, not just because I sit in traffic on a regular basis or that my friends are leaving the Bay Area, um, but mainly because those are barriers to opportunities for people, um, that it impacts the quality of life for us as ind individuals and as families, um, that it impacts the health of, of people here in the region um, that it is challenging the long-term economic and environmental sustainability of our region. 
And so I, I, I want to first say thank you to the chairs and to staff um, and to the technical committee for really driving this conversation. I think this has been amazing and something that I had dreamed of long before CASA was a thing, um, that, that every, all these disparate voices needed to get into a room and really start talking about solutions to this crisis. Um, I am at about a 2.5 <laughs> right now. <laughs> Um, and I'm taking liberties because I know the technical VIT committee was voting on halves, so I'm <laughs> taking that. Um, and, and, I, and I say that because I think that there are some really amazing and magical things that are in this that are guides um, for hopefully what will be a robust conversation and lead to some really transformational policies that will move the needle on housing in the Bay Area and potentially even statewide. Um, and so, but I, I have to balance that um, with some reservations that I have on the revenue side. I mean, there are folks here that have said, first, do no harm. And I think just sort of taking housing as a policy unto itself and really looking at it just, you know, in a vacuum and applying revenues seemingly arbitrarily to that and kind of taking a target number is dangerous um, when I think about sort of, <laughs> the conversations that I hear in the business community around the cost to operate and the, the competitiveness of the Bay Area um, to continue to be a place to do business. And so um, I, I don't want to say no. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it has to move forward and I think that there's some amazing things that need to take forward, but I do look forward to some really um, good conversations about what the right size is and, and how can we most make the most impact both on the revenue and on the reform side to increase housing production in the Bay Area and to preserve and protect the people that are here in the housing stock that's already here. That's it. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody, for both your time uh, in this in general and your time today. I'm going to try to be brief. I know one of the big questions is kind of what do we do with this, what we've got. Um, and I'll start with the easy stuff first. Um, one category is I, what I would call technical and administrative fixes. An example of that, uh, Julie, would be, um, you know, the u consistent use of the word emergency. Uh, and I think that those are the kinds of things that are uh, easy to fit in. I think a, another piece that also kind of fits into that category after we review this, uh, we're going to try to find uh, areas where there's consensus that something needs to uh, change for the better. And I think that that's something that we can do as well. Uh, what we don't have figured out is um, how we deal with issues that appear to need further negotiation. Uh, and what I would put into that category is, I think what I heard was a combination of too much focus on production, then you know, other folks who say not enough focus. Another piece of that is, in terms of the revenues and how they're used, too much that's focused in on the production side versus not enough that's focused in on preservation. Another big one is uh, too much time for deferral for sensitive communities, uh, and then the other is not enough time to plant. Uh, and so uh, I think that there are some areas here that will require ne um, some further negotiation, and we haven't figured out how to deal with those uh, given where we are. I think there are a few folks that mention, and I think, Jake, you fall into this category, and you're right. Uh, that this is a, additional stuff that's going to be worked out as it moves its way through the public process in the legislature. Um, but there may be some opportunities for us to kind of create um, more headway around some of that stuff uh, as well. So I think that we need to uh, figure that out. And I think um, the last thing I would mention is, and I think there's consensus on this, we know that there needs to be a roadshow uh, on this that kind of goes around uh, and uh, hits some key constituency groups to make sure that we have enough uh, momentum to uh, give this a chance uh, in Sacramento. So those are the kind of key areas of work, and I don't know if any of the other co-chairs want to think, say anything in closing, but I'm well aware that we are 40 minutes past 2 o'clock. 
I, you know, I would just thank those of you who've been able to stay this long because we are 40 minutes over and really appreciate everything that, that you told us. And I did take uh, pretty thorough notes. Uh, the co-chairs are meeting tomorrow, so we will talk through some of these concerns. I, I heard some common themes, and so I think um, uh, we just really appreciate it, and I think we'll be able to work through these things. On a point of order, co-chairs, uh, everybody gave their scores. So did somebody add them all up? Or uh, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, what's the result? What did we... Is the compact approved? What do I take to MTC next Oh, it's Wednesday? absolutely approved. We received no five votes at all. Uh, so, uh, and we received two four votes, and everything else we received was a three or above. And uh, Mike and I are trying to figure it out, but it's either between a, a 10 and, or 11 twos. We're, we're sorting that through. Leslie? Four um, ones. I have it. Uh, okay. Five ones, 11 twos, two threes, two fours, and zero fives. Agreed. It's an A minus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again, everyone.